Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Point. We are so glad that you have joined us here today. I have a few announcements for you all. Um, on Tuesday night, we will be having um, our men's Bible study. We call it Wild at Heart. Um, and it will be here at the church. Um, and it starts at 7 p.m. We will also be having a grad Sunday on June 2nd. Um, there is a slide going around before and after service that has a QR code on it to fill out a form. Um, and our form is also posted on Facebook. So if you are graduating in 2024 as a high school or college graduate, please fill out that form so we can give you a little gift and celebrate your graduation with you. Also on June 2nd, we will be having a soup and bake sale. Uh, and this is a fundraiser for our youth camp. Um, if you would like to make anything for this sale, please see Miss Angie. Um, and also be ready to buy lots of stuff because we need to send our kids to camp. Um, that should be it. Thank you all. Um, good morning. <laughs> please stand and worship with us this morning. Before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still in thrones above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So I could praise your great and matchless name All my days, all my days Now let my whole life be a blazing offering A life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God the world, but he couldn't feel me. 
praise and treasures the faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, but you still call me friends, cause the God of the mountain, he's the God of
Today's scripture reading will become from Psalms 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and you shall declare your mighty acts. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Dear God, as we take this time as an act of worship, I pray, Father, that you will bless the the tithes and the offerings, and may they continue to be used for further of your enhancement in your kingdom. We thank you for everything you do in supplying us with this blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning, Grace Point. Oh, come on. Let's wake up. Good morning, Grace Point. Good morning. Hey, good job. I have to apologize uh, for something. I thought about this after I did it last week. So I showed the video on Mother's Day of um, Mr. T. Uh, Yo, treat your mama right. My kids have been saying that song the whole week. So for those of you that are, yes, yes, see, there's a couple of them that are like, yeah, I like that song. So I apologize if at you. At this time, our kids are dismissed. Uh, so we, we have our check-in, and then the kids come in here, and they worship with us. We believe it's really important that they worship with us, and then they go down and cause chaos downstairs. Awesome. Amen. <clears throat> Isn't it so awesome to see so many kids going downstairs and, and God moving in our church and the youth? Amen? Amen. You might want to say a special prayer for Angie and her crew down there today because there's a lot. <laughs> But uh, hey, if you are a visitor with us, welcome. My name is Josh. I'm the pastor here, and um, we are so excited that you are with us. I'm excited to announce a few things. Um, I'm going to call them out right now. They probably don't want me to do this, but I'm going to. We are excited uh, to have with us this, uh, this Sunday uh, Cole and Dawn Burkett. So would you please stand, Cole and Dawn? Somewhere, where are you? Well, Cole's right there, yes. So make sure at some point... Uh, Cole is our new worship director, so at some point, make sure you introduce yourself and uh, and just tell them hi and give them a, a holy handshake, I guess is what they used to call it, or a hug, or I don't know what we do, what we're allowed to do post-COVID nowadays, but you do you, do you right? Um, so... But this morning, I want to thank you for being here. If you are a visitor with us, uh, make sure at the end of service you see me or my wife, uh, Rachel, at the high top table. We'd love to meet you, intro or introduce ourselves to you, and get to know your story. Here at Grace Point, we have our mission, I believe, is to seek people, love people, and share the story. What is the story? The story is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I believe that it's everybody in here has a story to share of how you came to know Christ and, and, and what he's done in your life. But as you see up on the screen, um, we have been in a series called Modeling Jesus. And I am happy to say, I hope, if he's in there, yes, he is in here, so you can back me up on this. Uh, there was a couple of us that went to the Church of God uh, Youth Department and had a golf uh, tournament uh, Monday, right? No, Thursday. See, I don't even know what day they had it. Thursday. Um, it was a busy day for me, but I got to go. And one thing you will find out about me is I am not a golfer, okay? Not a golfer one bit. And I wasn't using my own clubs. I was using Darren's clubs, Darren Stifler. Um, and I didn't throw any of the clubs. So that's good. I was modeling Jesus to the rest of the people. I wasn't that upset. Was I mad? Did I throw anything? No, he's shaking his head. No, I did not throw anything. I didn't hit anything either. So <laughs> just so you know, okay? So that's, if you ask me to go golfing, I probably will, but it's not going to be pretty. So. So, but this morning we're going to continue in our, uh, our Modeling Jesus series, and this is a tough topic to talk about this morning. Uh, so before we dig into what I believe God has for us, let's pray, okay? God, I thank you for being in our presence this morning during worship. Lord, you are so awesome. You are so holy, God. And, and Father, I pray right now. God, that for those that are in here, for those that are watching online, God, I pray that you just help us get through this message, even though it is a difficult topic, God. But Father, I pray that you give me the words to speak to the people, your, your people. I pray that it pierces their hearts. I pray that it pierces their minds and it just touches the people that are here that are online. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we are in this series, Modeling Jesus, and uh, we're going to continue about, well, first, you might be saying, well, why do we keep talking about this? Why do we keep talking about modeling Jesus? Because I believe we need to take a good look at the things that Jesus did when he was here on this earth. The things that he did, the way he navigated his life. He went through a lot of issues. If we read in his word in the New Testament, there was many obstacles that Jesus faced. 
And in my opinion, this is, today's message is a great message for everybody to hear, including myself. How many of you in here love conflict? How many of you like conflict? Okay. I, I, let's, let's see. If you do, if you raise your hand, you are sick individuals, okay? If you like conflict, you are sick individuals. But most of us, if we're being honest with ourselves and with each other, we do not like conflict, do we? We don't like to be in conflict with one another. We don't like to be in conflict with family. We don't mind, we don't like being in con conflict with people of the church, with with. Eh, just being honest, we don't like conflict. I would hope we don't like conflict, okay? Maybe it's in your workplaces, your churches, your homes, your marriages, with your kids, whatever it might be. But in this series, we've examined Jesus' life, and we've examined Jesus Christ as a human being. And we know that he faced every pressure that we've ever faced, and some on pretty deep levels, right? Right? He faced some pretty deep things in his life. And since I know that Jesus is the only perfect human being that has ever existed, I'm sorry for those of you that think you're perfect. You are not. I am not. Jesus was the only perfect individual that ever walked this planet and ever will. But I want to be very clear on this. We should be striving and modeling our life after his example, right? We should be modeling our lives after Jesus. It's pretty interesting. Jesus had a half-brother, and his name was James, okay? And when we think of James, what's fascinating to me, James had a front-row seat to Jesus. He had a front-row seat to Jesus' life. He had a front-row seat to see what Jesus was doing, how he was modeling his life after the Father, and there's some different things that James wrote about Jesus. And so we're going to kind of pick up and continue that in this message today. But that we're talking about conflict. How do we model Jesus in conflict? How do we do that? How can we model him when we have conflict with others? Did you know that in the year 20, 20, 2005, okay, 2005, the United States had more lawyers per capita than any other country in the world. More lawyers. Do I have any attorneys in here with me today? Thank you. I'm so glad. Thank you, Lord. Because this, I'm not picking on any attorneys, okay? But I just want to make that clear right now. But in 2005, there was 799,960 licensed lawyers in the United States. That was one lawyer for every 320 people. Again, I'm glad there's no lawyers or attorneys in here today. Maybe you're online. I hope not. But, well, I actually hope you are, but I am not picking on you, okay? I promise. I am not picking on you. But you're an easy target for this message because obviously lawyers have things to do with conflict resolution, don't they? Attorneys do. But as a result, because of the amount of lawyers that was in 2005, the United States also led the whole world in lawsuits. Lawsuits, okay? People were suing each other. Has anybody in here this morning ever heard of Stella Liebeck? Stella Liebeck. Nobody. I didn't think so. This is a fascinating story. You might not have heard of her name before, but let me just share with you her story. Stella is the woman, you might have heard, who sued McDonald's in 1992 after spilling coffee in her own lap. Stella was awarded, get this, don't, hey, don't try this after I preach this message and go to McDonald's today and try to do this because, hey, it's done, okay? You can't win any more from them. But Stella was awarded $2.9 million in damages by a New Mexico jury. And ever since, I know there's been people trying to rip McDonald's off, but ever since McDonald's had to warn their people that their coffee was hot. <laughs> Duh. You, I, if you go to McDonald's now and you get a coffee, for those of you that love McDonald's coffee, you'll see on there, warning, 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 all these stars. Coffee may be hot. Okay. 
But she was awarded uh, $2.9 million after spilling it in her own lap. You know, that's, is it Jeff Foxworthy that says, duh, there's your sign, or one of those hillbilly comedian guys? Coffee is supposed to be hot, right? But she got awarded this. But Stella won because that warning prior to that was not on that cup. So some of you guys are sitting there. I see your, the wheels turning in your mind. What can we do? What fast food joint can we go to? But um, so Stella won that $2.9 million because of that. Okay. Today, I hope I can share with you some conflict stories and some things that uh, have happened in people's lives that we can see how we as believers of Christ, we as followers of Christ, how we can model Jesus in our conflict with each other. And that's difficult. Last year or two years ago, I read this story too. Kobe Bryant. You guys have heard of Kobe Bryant before? He's an awesome basketball player. Uh, the great Kobe Bryant. I don't know if anybody's heard this story before, but Kobe Bryant, his mother-in-law, after Kobe's death, was suing, um, was suing her own daughter, Vanessa Bryant. Anybody hear this story before? This is a true story. You can look it up. Kobe Bryant's mother-in-law was suing her own daughter, Vanessa Bryant. Why? Because, and if we have grandparents in here, get this one. She was suing her own daughter because the mother-in-law said that because she watched her grandkids, she should be given $4.5 million because she was a caregiver at some point for Kobe Bryant and Vanessa Bryant's kids. Isn't that ridiculous? Don't get any ideas. <laughs> My dad, okay? Yeah, you need to get, a, there's no attorneys in here, so you're not good today, all right? <laughs> But that's ridiculous. So grandparents, do not think that just because you watched your, your grandkids, you can go sue your kids for, for that. It's a true story. I'm not making this up. You can look this up. Again, I'm not bashing lawyers this morning. That's not what the intention is to do. But we have to ask the question, is there a better way to resolve conflict than dragging somebody to court? Is there a better way? For those of us that follow Christ, how do we respond to our brothers and sisters in Christ when we are wronged or when somebody hurt us? That's tough, isn't it? When we're wronged and when somebody hurt us, the first thing we want to do is what? Lash out, don't we? It's a difficult topic to talk about in dealing with conflict. You know, hopefully here in our church in the fall, I want to start what's called point groups. Okay, within our, within our borough, within the outskirts of our borough, and, and all throughout the county. In these point groups, when, I, when we do launch these, I encourage you to get plugged in. I encourage you to be part of this small group. It's a Bible study, but it's a, it, it's a place where we grow together in God's Word and with one another and how we can deal with things like this, things like to, or conflict. We can deal with the external symptoms that we deal with every single week and every day. And not only learn from what God's word says, but come alongside of each other and do life together and encourage one another. I, we talked about this two weeks ago. We need more encouragers in today's world, don't we? We need more people to encourage and to lift each other up instead of tear each other down. Today's message, though, we're going to focus on a couple external symptoms and what we can learn from Jesus on how he resolved conflict, particularly, particularly between other believers and, and, and Christ followers. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to look at two passages this morning, but I want you to turn to, um, let's see, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 this morning, and we'll be in verse 23. So let me start there. And I encourage you to, if you do not have a Bible, our, our church folks might get tired of me saying this, but I'm, I'm, I think it's very important. If you don't own a Bible, there's one in front of you. Take it home. Keep it. It's our gift to you. I think it's really important to navigate through a hard life with God's word. It's the, it's the map that will take you through those tough times. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 23. All right. So it says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar 
And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly while you're acute with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So this is Jesus' teaching on how to handle conflict, okay? Now, we've read that. I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter 18. I'll give you folks a few minutes to flip over or put it on your, um, your phones or however you do it. Matthew chapter 15, or 18, I'm sorry. And we are going to be in verse 15, okay? 15 through 17. It says this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen to it, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen to even the church, teach them as you would a pagan or a tax collector." Another translation says a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, what's fascinating to me, though, is in verse 17, a pagan and a tax collector represented those who rebelled against God, those people who did not follow God, therefore excluded themselves from Christian fellowship at that time. That's the words in, of, in, in Matthew that we read. So we read two verses about Jesus and how can we handle conflict. And Jesus' advice about conflict resolution in these passages can be boiled down to a few simple principles, I believe, that would help all of us, or at least 99% of the conflicts that we are facing or experiencing, or we might have in the future with other people. And they're, they're short, they're simple. I think sometimes we do too much and we try to put too much of our own stuff into the Word of God when it's very simple, it's very to the point. And so that's kind of what we're going to do this morning. We're going to break these two passages down, okay? So, you know I like to keep you guys involved so nobody falls asleep on me, okay? If you're a baby, you can go to sleep. That's good. All right. Everybody, we read these this morning. So, are you guys ready? All right? Everybody, the first thing that we can do in... in, in Dealing with conflict. Let's see if you guys were listening to that scripture. What's the first thing that you should do? Go to the person what? Face to face. Face to face, right? Second, or I'm sorry, no, I'm wrong. Quickly, quickly. Second thing is you do it face to face. So we go quickly. We don't let the sun go down on our wrath, right? We talked about that in Proverbs a couple weeks ago. We do it face to face. The third one is what? One to one. One to one. It's kind of similar to face to face. And the fourth thing that Jesus said in those passages is what? If we can't deal with the conflict re resolution ourselves, get help. Get help. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned that a believer who harbored anger against their brother or sister get this one, was just as guilty as a murderer in God's eyes. Just as guilty as a murderer in God's eyes. It's crazy to think about, isn't it? But that's what Jesus says in God's eyes. If we have anger with a person, we are just as guilty as committing murder. That being said, it tells us that since that is how God sees your anger and my anger, how important is it for us to get rid of that anger? What Jesus did the first thing says, do it what? Quickly. Get rid of it. Get rid of your anger. Throw it out. Do what you have to do. How important is it for us to model Jesus and understand when things start to go wrong? And when we start to have a disagreement, when we start to have a confrontation, we need to get rid of our anger quickly. We cannot harbor it. I know that's hard for a lot of us, isn't it? It's hard for me. Growing up, 
My family, we're not proud of it, but we had a bad trait. We had a bad reputation called the Kirksey temper. A lot of the males had bad tempers, okay? I never did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I did, okay? In fact, I can't believe I'm going to share this story with you. My dad's probably going to be like, oh, no, okay? I share a lot of stories. If you're new with us, I share a lot of crazy stories, so just bear with me. But there was a time when uh, I played basketball in a church basketball league. Any, uh, anybody ever played in a church basketball league before? Okay. Sometimes those are not really Christ-like, are they? Sometimes, probably most of the time, tempers flare things get a little crazy you're all sweaty bumping into other guys and like fighting I don't know but so just quick story I I was in and I, they used to call me Mark Price back in the day you guys remember Mark Price no the young people are like who's that you know but uh no I used to like to shoot threes but this particular game I was having a pretty good game or at least I remember it that way it might have been having a bad game but I don't remember that but I remember having a good game and I was on fire it seemed like everything I threw up there went in and my coach took me out of the game and we were winning when I was in there but then when we when he took me out, we started losing. And it wasn't, I, I'm just going to sound terrible, it wasn't just me, because basketball, any sport is a team sport, okay? Except golf. Well, in Thursday it was a team sport. But, so we started losing when I got out of the game. And I was so angry. I was so upset. And I was young, okay? I was immature. Um, but when I walked off the court, I took my jersey off and I threw it at his face. Threw it at his face. And that is not how to handle conflict, okay? So just be known for me to you, that is not how to handle conflict. I did not model Christ in my actions to those people that were in that gym. And there was a lot of them. And people were very disappointed in me. I, after I did it, was disappointed in myself. But in Jesus' eyes, according to what I just read to you, because what I was doing was wrong in my example and my anger, it was no different than some of the other things, like murder. Remember, he just said, if you hold on to anger, you're just as guilty as committing murder. And I know it's hard for us to, to think about this topic, and sometimes we feel we have a right to be angry when we've been wronged, okay? We feel that we have a right to get upset. And there are those of us that might be in this room this morning that have held on to anger and resentment for so long, for so long in your life, that literally you do not know who you would be or what you would talk about if you did not have those hurts that you were harboring and defining you in your life. I know there's some of you that are in this room this morning that feel that way. I also know that there are those that are in here today and watching online. Some of you have very painful backgrounds. I know that. I don't want to minimize any of the pain that you've gone through, whether it be through church hurt, whether it be through family hurt, friend hurt, spouse hurt, whatever hurt you're dealing with. I don't want to minimize that. Maybe you were in an abusive relationship. And what Jesus calls for this pa in this passage and in these passages that we read, it's not easy, is it? It's not easy to let go of hurt and anger. It's not easy to model Jesus in conflict, is it? I know it's not. I know that. And I want to tell you first, it might actually benefit you to get professional help. See a counselor, okay? And it's okay to do that. I don't want to belittle that fact. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 25, Jesus tells us that conflict has to be handled quickly. Quickly. In verses 23 and 24, he even implies that settling conflict is more important than worship. More important than worship. To the point that if you're in the middle of the worship service, if you're in the middle of hearing me talk right now and you're not sleeping yet, you get up and you go and you handle the conflict. That's what Jesus is telling us in Matthew. 
Be reconciled to your brothers or your sisters. And then what do you do? You come back to worship. And that's hard. That's, that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's a hard thing for us to take an inventory of our life, okay? Take a look at our life and get rid of that conflict, get rid of the pain that we're going through, and to get rid of the things that have happened to us in our lifetime. The question that I have for you this morning, could it be that God won't even accept your worship until you make things right with your brothers or sisters? That's a question that we have to ask. But in Jesus' words, honestly, it seems that's what the passage is saying. Passage, passages just such as John, 1 John, excuse me, 420, back that up too. We've talked about this the past couple weeks. It says in 1 John 420, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who hates his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So the first point that I have for you this morning in dealing with our conflict, we need to do it quickly. Handle it quickly. So when you have an issue with another person, another believer, deal with it fast. Deal with it quickly. Dad used to tell me all the time when we'd get angry with each other, hey, Proverbs talks about don't let the sun go down on our wrath. So let's talk it out. Let's have that communication about it. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. So Jesus is telling you if you have anger, Deal with it quickly. The second thing that Jesus tells us to do is do it what? Face to face, right? Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. That's important. Come on. That's very important. Just between the two of you. I don't want to sing that. It's just the two of us. Okay. <laughs> Notice I did not say... Facebook to Facebook. Uh oh. Notice I did not say text message to text, mes text message. Well, I mean, sometimes you might have to. Okay? I didn't say social media to social media. You know, some people like to post on somebody's wall or post on somebody's page. Can you believe what that new pastor did last week during Mother's Day? He played Mr. T, treat your mama right in church. Do you believe that? And they're posting it on social media or they're, or they're doing this. Jesus says, go do it face to face. Go talk to them face to face. And you all know face to face communication is harder now than it ever was before, isn't it? We've got a lot of keyboard warriors out there. Some of you guys might be champs in this region. <laughs> hey, I'm not pointing fingers. But we got a lot of people that just sit behind a keyboard and just or a text message and just want to spew venom, spew venom towards each other. It's harder every single day now with our technology, text messages, right? Te text messages. Sometimes if I'm not even angry and I send something to you, it sounds like I'm yelling at you and I promise you I'm not. Or it comes across the wrong way, doesn't it? like man why is he getting so upset I'm not man just based on the wording that I put in my text our society is moving further and further away from face to face communication that used to be the only option right can I get a right or something in here it used to be our only option we didn't have phones we could just do this through it was face to face you know but now now we don't have it now we're doing all these different things online through media platforms. Used to be face-to-face. -face. After that, it came the invention of handwriting. You wrote somebody a letter. You wrote somebody an angry letter and didn't sign it or something and put it, put it somewhere. After that came the telephone, right? Maybe you call them and, and, and say something on the phone to somebody. After that, it came emails, right? And then text messages, now, you know, if you're mad at somebody, you can just tweet it. Tweet, 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 tweet. Twitter, if anybody has Twitter, I don't even know if that's still a cool thing or not. That shows you I'm not up to date. But we have to do it quickly. We have to do it face-to-face, one-to-one. Imano, imano. 
Has anybody ever sat down at a computer or started a text message and, you know, you're just angry? I don't know what happened, but you're, there's a situation, you're just fuming right now. And you know, you write out this, this five-page essay of why you're angry or this five-page email, you know, the story of why you're upset with somebody or, 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 or what, you're, what they're doing wrong, or, and then you start to think about what you're doing in that moment, right? Right? And you start to think about it. If I press send and let this bad boy fly, am I modeling Jesus? Anybody been there before? I've been there many times, okay? Or you think, should I be sending this message to someone? And then you just delete it. Anybody been there and done that before? It's okay. Oh, look, see, we got honest people. Good. That's awesome. But see, that's what Jesus is telling us to do, though, church. Do it face to face. Don't send an email. Don't send a text message. He also tells us to do it one-to-one, face-to-face, but also one-to-one. Chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along. So the first part that Jesus tells us is to do it one-to-one. Pay attention to that second part, though. It says, just between the two of you. Now, right away, I might have just identified a sin in your life as you heard that. Or an accountability partner that that has been helping you commit sin for years. You might think, well, what's that? Raise your hand in here this morning. Well, don't do it. I don't know. Do not raise your hand. Let me blot that out of my message today. Think about... If you've ever talked about someone before you talk to someone, you've talked about someone before you talk to that someone. Okay, we're all there, right? We all have some mutual accountability in here. We've done it before. And if we're being really super spiritual, some of us might have even made it into a prayer request before. You say, oh God, Come on Wednesday nights to our Bible study. God, I really need you to pray, you know, or you're in a group and you're all praying and, you know, it's, you want to share this. You say, God, I need you to pray for my relationship with Bob. You see, Bob is such a jerk (laughs) and I cannot handle Bob anymore. I cannot, (laughs) if we have Bobs in here, I'm sorry. Sorry, Rob. Your name is Rob to me, so sorry. I cannot handle Bob at all. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know why he did what he did. But Bob wasn't being very Christ-like. So you can take Bob, Lord, and you can put him in some other place. Or put him in his place. Any of us ever done that before? I've heard it, so don't tell me we haven't. (laughs) I've heard it. No matter how, though, we might dress it up or spiritualize it, it's wrong to talk about someone before you talk to someone. Hello? It's wrong to talk about them before you talk to them. The one exception we read and I just shared with you is that rule when you talk to God about the conflict that you're having. Talk to Jesus. Talk to the Lord. Talk to God. How many times do we see in Jesus' own life what he modeled to us? Where he went and he got got off by himself and he talked to his father one-to-one about situations that he was facing. He had one-on-one communication with God the Father all the time. Shouldn't we be doing the same thing? Not with each other, with the Lord. So if you're having problems, talk to God. He knows it already, but just talk to him. Go to him in prayer. It's a necessary step. Pray about the conflict that you're having before you address it with the other person. But go into prayer humbly, not arrogantly. Okay? Pray about it humbly. In fact, I want to take it a step further, and I want you to ask the Lord to help show you where you might be wrong in this situation. Where we might be wrong. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it, sometimes? You know, we don't want to admit that maybe sometimes we play a role in that situation. You know, but I want you to pray, God, help me see where I can handle this situation a little bit better. Ask for wisdom. Help you to identify the parts of conflict that you own. 
So talk to God about the person before you talk to the other person. Okay? Talk to the Father first. All right, I want to stop. I want to address the obvious question related to these three principles that we've been talking about this morning, okay? Before we get to the fourth one. What if, what if you can't get to the other person before the sun goes down? Hmm. What if you had an argument with this person? What if you had a confrontation before the sun goes down? What if the sun go, has gone down on your anger? You see, lots and lots of times since you first became angry, or what if the person that you've been harboring, harboring anger against isn't here with us anymore? What do we do in this situation? That's tough, because I'm sure some of you have that example in that situation. You see, if it's impossible to resolve, or if you've been hanging on to anger for years then I believe the best thing that we can do in this situation is say to yourself, I am canceling the debt that this person owes me. I'm canceling the debt. Because I've said it many, many, many times in here. It's like us hoping, you know, to, to give somebody poison and it's in our cup and we're the only ones sipping from it. Is it affecting the other people or the other families? No, it's affecting you. You're festering in your anger, okay? I believe that if we cancel that person's debt, if they are no longer here with us, it will do so much better for your life moving forward. Forgiving one another. Canceling the debt that's owed to you. You see, this doesn't mean that the other person really and truly did not do you wrong. I don't want you to hear me this morning and think, oh, well, he, well, he doesn't even know the situation. That doesn't mean that they did not do you wrong. That's not what I'm saying today to you. They absolutely could have done you wrong, or they might have, or something. And maybe you do deserve an apology, and you probably do, okay? But what I'm simply saying is that the apology that I'm owed, because I can no longer get it, I am canceling that debt. I'm no longer obligating that person to an apology. You see, folks, this is the way that Jesus modeled his life in handling conflict. And if he modeled his life in these situations of conflict, shouldn't we be doing the same thing as believers in Christ? Shouldn't that be us? We need to be modeling Jesus in our conflicts. And not, that's not just with people that are in our church. That's not just people that are within our workplaces. It's with people that are within our families too, okay? Uh-oh, here we go. Strap on the seatbelt, right? Families are difficult, right? All right, I got like two. Families are hard. Families are difficult. I know my dad's here, my wife's back there. If any of my family's watching online, I hope you're not, but if you are, I apologize, I love you. But I think that if we look at Matthew chapter 18, and if we look at the other verses that Jesus tells us on how we can model conflict, I think it can help us in, in modeling Jesus in our conflicts with our families. Matthew 18, and, and verse 17 says, But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, to tell it to the church. If they still refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. You see, we need to get help sometimes in conflict. We can't do it on our own. If we can do it on our own, absolutely, that's what Jesus recommends. Do it face to face, man to man. That's what he's telling us to do. But sometimes we can't do that. And in that verse in Matthew, it tells us to take it to the church first. To one or two trusted spiritual Men or women of God who can help you mediate your conflict. That's what the Lord is telling us. I'm not telling you right now to take it to Sally, you know, Sally who spreads lies and gossips and rumors. Hey, do you hear what Bob did the other day? Bob, I'm not Rob, I'm not picking on you. 
Did you hear what Bob did the other day? That's not what I'm saying to, to, to do. Don't go to the church gossip. Don't go to the, to, the, to the one who just spews venom. And it's not what Jesus is telling you to do. Take it to the leaders of the church. There was a situation at a, a church that we were part of that there was a big, big deal between two families at our church. So what happened? The families were just angry at each other. They did not like one another. So what did they do? They took it to the church. They took it to the leadership, the pastor, the elders of the church, the people that have been there before. They talked about their conflict. And because you never know, maybe they might be able to mediate it and maybe they might be thinking something different than both of you guys. If there's still no resolution, then there's the next levels that you can go to. Again, it says in Matthew chapter 18, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Church, this is the command that Jesus, that Jesus is telling us right now is one of the hardest ones for us to follow. But yet I'm telling you, it's not optional. It's not an optional one this morning. But yet it's so consistently violated within churches, within families, within people's lives. And people that claim to be Christ followers, we constantly violate this law. If we can learn to handle conflict well in our life, the benefits are significant. In fact, I'm going to take it a step further. If you can handle conflict well within the church, within your families, within your friends, then you're probably going to have healthier relationships with everyone, right? You're probably going to be healthier even overall, mentally, physically, spiritually. Every close relationship that we will ever experience will have a certain amount of conflict. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to get hurt and be hurt at times. But to ignore that and to allow it to fester in your heart and in your mind, it will lead to relationships remaining shallow, strained, or artificial. Another thing that I had already briefly touched on that we need to do when we're modeling Jesus in our conflict, we must own responsibility. We must own responsibility in that. You see, we want to wait for the other person to approach us a lot of times. Anybody ever done that before? We want them to be the first one to come to us. Well, we read in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, no, no. No, 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 no. Remember, if you're at worship and you remember that you're harboring anger against somebody, what are you supposed to do? Leave your gift at the altar, go and make amends with your brother or sister. So we need to own responsibility. But a lot of times we just sit there and we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait for the other person. We wait for it. But you might ask yourself this morning, why should I have to take that first step? Why, why Josh? Why should I have to be the first one to, to make amends? Well, it's pretty simple. It's pretty cut and dry here in Matthew. The fact is, Jesus Christ tells us to take the initiative, to set things right, no matter if we're on the receiving end or the wrong end or the giving end. Jesus tells us to take that step. So own responsibility this morning. Don't avoid that person that we're in conflict with. See, I've shared this with a few of you, and dad, my dad definitely knows this story, but for many, many, many years, I was holding bitterness, unforgiveness, conflict, anger towards a specific family that we were very close with as a family in our own life. Okay? They had done us wrong. I know that. I'm not you know, proud of that, but I was holding bitterness and anger and, and all this stuff. And so the preacher was preaching on this and I'm sitting there and I kid you not, my wife, is she in here? I don't know. But if she is, she'll tell you to this day, this, this happened. God has a sense of humor. Anybody know that? I mean, he created me. So, you know, it's, it's a sense of humor, but God has a very unique sense of humor, I believe. 
because we lived in the same city that this family lived in, okay? They did our family very, very wrong, okay? Just being real. They lived in the same city. Every time, every time we would see them out in the community or in the, in the area, I would go the other way, you know? I'm like, all right, I don't want to deal with this person, this jerk, or probably say some other things in my head. I just didn't want to deal with them. And so then we were very plugged in at a very large church in Ohio. And I actually said to the Lord, God, you know, I want to serve you with my whole life. I want to do this. But it comes to the point where if this family comes to this church, I don't want anything to do with them. I said that. I said that to myself, said that to probably my wife. I don't know. And that's how I was feeling. I remember we were, I was getting ready to teach, um, or getting ready to go to a class we were uh, going to be in, and it was kind of for new members and stuff of the church, and so we're getting ready, we're, we're there, there's, again, there's 1,500 people that went to this church, okay, multiple classes, different times, and so we're in line, and uh, we're getting ready to check in, and I hear my wife next to me, and she goes, oh boy, Oh boy, this could be interesting. I, that's ex I, I'm literally, that's what she said. I kind of turned back, I turned around, and here's that family that I'd been running away from for two to three years, okay? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, really? Really, God? Why? Why? And so I remember sitting in there, and who's at our table? Yep. Yep, they're at our table. Was it awkward? Yes. My wife will tell you, tension probably could have cut through that sanctuary. It was awkward. But we talked it out. We had conversations with them. We talked about our problems. We talked about our issues. And can I tell you to this day, are we ever like we probably were at one point? No, but I love them. I do, I forgive them. I don't harbor that bitterness any longer because folks, when I was holding on to that anger, when I was holding on to that bitterness, it affected me. It affected our family. When I've released it, when I say, God, here it is, it's yours. I release these people from this. It's no longer on mine. Do you know the miracles that took place in, in our family's life, in our relationships with people? Own responsibility. We also, again, need to watch our approach when we deal with our anger, okay? Proverbs 29, 11 tells us, it says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. You see, so if you can effectively manage your anger, I, I, I want you to, if you take notes, write these two down if I don't have them in your notes. But I encourage you to write these two questions down. Okay, When you're starting to feel angry, when you're starting to feel upset, when you're feeling like you're getting angry, I want you to ask yourself the first question. Why am I angry? Simple, right? Why am I angry? And the next question I want you to ask yourself when you start to feel like that, it would follow off of this. How can I respond in a way that shows love? How can I respond to this person in a way that will model Jesus to them? That's actually three questions, so obviously my math was a little bit off. But you, we need to ask ourselves that. How can I respond? How would Jesus respond? No third parties, right? That's what Matthew says, or that's what Jesus says in Matthew. No third parties, just between the two of you. But most often, the last person you want to talk to about is the first one that Jesus tells us to go to, isn't it? Uh-oh. The last person we want to talk about it to, to a, with is the first one that Christ tells us to go to, the one that did us wrong. The person that we have conflict with is the last person we want to talk to. All right, let me fast forward because time is running short. <laughs> The last thing that I want to mention about dealing with, with conflict to you this morning and about modeling Jesus in your conflict 
is what I believe all of us, we need to do if we have conflict in our life. You know what we need to do? We need to aim at reconciliation. Aim at it. It says specifically if in there, if they listen to you, you have won them over. The goal isn't just telling them how much they messed up, folks, or releasing the tension that has been built up inside of you for so long. It's to build a better, stronger relationship with that person, no matter how difficult that may be. Let's not ignore the clear call and the clear challenge of Jesus when he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, he says, the sin of resentment and gossip and bitterness have huge collateral damage. It's a critical issue, church, for Jesus because love is his supreme value. There's no greater command, no greater badge of identification for us as believers. Who did Jesus tell us to love? Did he say, go love your friends? No. Love your enemies, right? Love those who persecute you. He wants us to love all. But this morning, I want to ask, how are you handling conflict? Is there an inventory you could take in your life and, or somebody that comes to your mind that you're just having a really hard time with? I want you to pray this morning. I'm going to pray in just a few short seconds. And I want you to pray and I want you to ask God, God, show me where I can model you in, a, in conflict with this person or with these people. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you so much. God, that you have given us a blueprint of your life, that you've given us a map that we can follow, especially for those difficult conversations in the difficult times that we're in. When we deal with conflict, Lord. God, when we're in conflict, I pray that we remember that the ultimate goal is to aim at re reconciliation with that person so that they can see you shining clearly in our life. Father, I pray for anyone in here that's been wronged this morning. I pray for anyone in here that's been hurt this morning, whether it's from a church, from church people, whether it's from families, friends, kids, spouses. I pray for those that are in here. I also pray for those that are watching online that have been hurt. God, I pray that you just miraculously heal Heal their hearts. Heal their minds. But I also ask that, they, that you help them and pray that they forgive that person that has done them wrong. Just as you have forgiven us from all of our sins, God. God, I pray that we realize how much you do love us, but not only just us, that you love the person that we're in conflict with. God, I pray that others see your love in our life. And I pray that we get rid of conflict quickly, that we get rid of pain quickly, that we get rid of anger quickly. God, I pray right now for those that are very confrontational, because there are people that are very confrontational. Lord, I pray that they look at your words in Matthew chapter 18. God, that the Holy Spirit would just convict them right now. Father, help them to look at their own life, that they need to take a look at the inventory and how they deal with people and how they deal with conflict. I pray for each and every single one of them. God, I thank you for bringing us here this morning. God, I pray that as we go this week, as we leave this place here this week, there's going to be times that we know that we're going to be faced with conflict whether it's with our families, jobs, friends, coworkers. Father, I pray that we handle conflict in a way that is pleasing to you, in a way that is modeling your son, Jesus Christ, to others. Amen. We all stand and we'll, as we get ready to worship, these altars are always open. If you know of a situation that you just want to pray for, I'd be happy to pray with you. I know some others would be happy to pray with you up here.
but let's remember, model Jesus in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Before I dismiss, I'm just going to say that I'm going to get called Bob at work, so everything's cool with me and Pastor Josh. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of coming to your house this morning to praise and worship you and to learn more about you. Father, I pray right now as we dismiss that you'll go ahead and give us safe traveling mercies until we... I come back to your house again to learn more about you. We thank you and praise you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.